Oh yeah, what's up everybody? We're gonna do things just a little bit differently today. Now, as some of you may be aware, I recently put up a post in the community section asking people to reply with ideas for stuff they'd like us to cover or maybe talk about. There's already been more than a few responses, so I thought it'd be fun to put together a little mailbag segment or something every once in a while and address a few of them. I think it'd be cool to maybe make this a bi-weekly or once a month thing, depending on how many responses we continue to get. And for today's episode, we're going to focus on what looks to be a very contentious issue for pretty much everybody, or at least something some of you want to hear me talk more shit about, Square Enix. That's right, look out Yashi P, we're going deep inside. Yashi? Yashi P? Is it Yoshi P or Yashi P? I feel like it would be Yoshi P, but I've also heard like way too many people pronounce it Yashi. I don't know, that's weird. <laughs> anyway, Square Enix. Now, whether it's about existing or upcoming remakes, current or older games, Square Enix has a major problem that I think we all need to come to terms with. They've basically become the new Activision Blizzard. What do I mean by that? Simple. They, like Blizzard, are a developer that many of us grew up with. They made many of our all-time favorite games, or at the very least, games we loved, and likely were a formative part of both our youth and our overall taste in games, entertainment, stuff like that. And now, like Blizzard, they make me want to puke my fucking guts out. Rapacious, corpo money-grubbing, and reckless, bloodthirsty big business capitalism have once again hollowed out and gored all traces of the heart and soul from a once beloved developer. The magic is clearly gone, and I don't think it's coming back, guys. Just like Blizzard. Once upon a time, Square Enix was a bastion of creativity and innovation, filled with brilliant, talented, and passionate people whose only goal was to make incredible games that people loved just like Blizzard, and now their goal is instead profit above all else. A focus and dedication to things like deep RPG systems, compelling gameplay, and engrossing narratives have all been replaced with KPI targets, minimum viable product metrics, MAU drivers, and player data harvesting. It's obscenity. And once again, just like Blizzard, people refuse to see it or accept it. And also, just like Blizzard, the only games of theirs that anyone wants to play anymore are the old ones. And the only new ones that people really care about are remakes of the old ones, just like Blizzard. And yo, listen, like, I get not wanting to believe it. I empathize, and to an extent, I even understand the biblical levels of cope involved. Saying goodbye to an old friend or admitting the best times of a relationship or job or whatever are over, they're not things anyone wants to do. But the thing is, sometimes they are things you have to do. Now, <laughs> that's probably a bit melodramatic when talking about a video game company, so let's say letting go of a company like Square Enix is not something you have to do, but rather maybe something you should do for the sake of sparing all our timelines, your sad corpo bootlicking, if nothing else. This is a story we've heard many times before, certainly enough to know how it ends. What we're witnessing is Square Enix finally embracing their inner Activision and smothering what remains of their creative talent and brand value in the crib while it's weak. Don't believe me? Uh, someone remind me of how well Forspoken did again. And what about their precious Devil May Fantasy 16? Square Enix is a business, and in business, due to fiduciary regulations, things like that, the one thing companies can't or aren't supposed to obfuscate or lie about is numbers and money. Now, people can internet all they want about it, but no amount of tweets or legacy media op-ed cope is going to change the fact that incredibly successful games don't typically get Bloomberg articles detailing how their developer is, quote, grappling with weak momentum on a flagship franchise. And in the rare instances where that does happen, salient or convincing rebuttals where you insist that the game has sold well don't usually include palliative phrases like relative to the current PS5 install base. Final Fantasy 16 sold barely 3 million copies in its entire launch week. Now for comparison, the FF7 remake sold 3.5 million in just three days, and Final Fantasy 15 sold 5 million in just its first day. Though in fairness, that wasn't a PlayStation exclusive. Even worse news for the latest edition of Devil May Fantasy came when it was announced by Famitsu recently that Japanese sales had dropped a staggering 90% in its second week, being easily dethroned by market-shattering industry juggernaut Master Detective Archive's Rain Code for the Nintendo Switch. Now, in the interest of fairness, a 3 million copy moving launch week is hardly a failure by any metric other than Square Enix's own expectations. I'm not saying it's doing badly at all. From what I've seen, in fact, it looks like it's been selling fine. But you all seem really worried about it. I mean, self-proclaimed industry blockbusters don't often need their marketing people to make statements like this. 
Taking into consideration the sales figures of the acclaimed Final Fantasy VII Remake, and the difference in size of the install base of the PlayStation 4 at the time of the title's release, we can see that the attach rate of Final Fantasy 16 is considerably high, given the PS5 install base. We consider the initial sales results of Final Fantasy 16 to be extremely strong, and we will continue to carry out a wide range of initiatives to encourage even more people to play the game. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't really scream confidence to me, and calculated language like attach rates seem more than a little conveniently euphemistic. Why are you saying attach rate anyway? You used sales figures to describe the FF7 remake numbers in the very same statement. Why attach rate instead for FF16? Is that only referring to game copies sold with a PS5 system purchase? Which is it? You'll notice they don't feel the need to clarify here. Speaking further in defense of Square Enix when talking to IGN, industry analyst Luis Woolridge had this to say. Final Fantasy XVI launched into market conditions that were quite different than the ones that Final Fantasy VII Remake and Final Fantasy XV launched in. For example, FF16 is a PS5 exclusive, and it launched earlier in the PS5 life cycle than Final Fantasy VII Remake did in the PS4 life cycle. When the PS5 active installed base is less than 40 million globally, sales of 3 million are certainly not poor. This may be below Square Enix's expectations, but the launch environment and mature rating of the game do limit its potential somewhat. Uh, Alright, cool. That makes sense, I guess, but I also feel like there's a lot of words in there like life cycle and globally and phrases like install base, launch environment, mature rating, and limited potential. And I don't know, that just kind of sounds like a bunch of excuses to me. We know a game as big as a mainline Final Fantasy entry can't be allowed to fail due to the repercussions and financial ramifications it could have for the entire industry. And I don't know, y'all sound just a little bit too nervous to me. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that any further in this video, but if you do want to hear more about how a game franchise and industry temple can be too big to fail, check out my video on that here. The franchise itself, though, is far from being over, of course. Some of those numbers were only from Japan, and as I've mentioned before, I think it's pretty obvious Square has decided to focus on Western audiences with Final Fantasy and leaving Dragon Quest as their tentpole franchise back home and in the East. Much more integral to their Western strategy going forward is likely to be stuff like remakes or re-releases, in true Activision 4. Remakes, as well as remasters, are an interesting topic, though, at least more so than the agonizing, dismal decay of Square Enix in the grip of capitalist entropy. Now, as someone in our community noted, they have the potential to be awesome. That's probably why there's such a lightning rod for controversy and soyjack memes. Now, on one hand, you could get something like the awesome Trials of Mana remake, the Metroid Prime remaster, or the Resident Evil 2 remake. On the other hand, you could get something like the Final Fantasy VII, huge air quotes here, remake. I, like many of you, am caught between the tempting desire to see old classics made easily playable on modern hardware, and my fear of the raw terror that comes from being forced to watch them ruined in real time, like some sort of deranged alternate dimension version of Saw. In general, my philosophy is that if all you're going to do is upscale the polys or remaster slash remake some of the textures and not touch the gameplay or anything else, well, I'm mostly fine with that. Anything beyond that, though, and you're fucking with shit that likely should not be fucked with, least of all by people like you. Complete remakes that are truly good games, like System Shock or Trials of Mana, are incredibly rare and definitely the exception, not the rule. Someone else in the community mentioned how much they'd love to see a Final Fantasy IX remake that looks like the FF9 Memoria project. Fuck yeah. But they knew, and to quote them, that there's a snowball's chance in hell Square could ever make something like that without monetizing the shit out of it. Yes, correct. I could not agree more. Square Enix has been transformed into a company that either cannot or will not greenlight projects below a certain profit margin. It just is what it is. I highly doubt that a fan-focused, one-to-one adaptation of a PlayStation title with a gameplay style that they've long since given up on marketing to the West would clear that bar without the injection of cynical, nightmarish monetization schemes and data harvesting disguised as some form of gibbed network feature. And that's the sad reality, and honestly, sometimes, eh, maybe for the best. Could anyone really stomach watching them do to another game what they did to Final Fantasy VII? I couldn't. As always, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, guys, but it's time. Just like Blizzard, I think we need to let Square Enix die. But then again, Dragon Quest is fucking awesome, so never mind, forget all that. <laughs> forget I said anything. Yeah, yeah.
Woke up, smoke up, locked in, I pass out, pass, pass out, huh? Woke up, what up, smoke up, locked in, I'm back down, back, back down, what? Yup, yup, woke up, smoke up, blunt, then I pass out, pass, pass out, huh? Woke up, what up, smoke up, blunt, then I'm...